All right, today is September 6, 2017. Uh, my name is Christopher Rich. I'm leading the interview today for the Veterans History Project. Assisting me is a local veteran from Williamsburg, Ohio, Mr. Roy Abrams, and also assisting me doing the indexing for the interview is uh, Miss Ashley LeMasters from the Williamsburg branch. Uh, today we have the pleasure to be inter interviewing Mr. Gary Koifer. And your date of birth, sir? Is April the 28th, 1948. And the uh, war and branch of the war you were involved with? I was involved during the time of the Vietnam conflict. And your branch of service? My branch of service was the United States Navy. And finally, the highest rank you achieved? I achieved the rank of uh, an E-5, which in the Navy is Petty Officer Second Class. All right, well, let's go back to growing up. So, Gary, you said you were born in Norwood, Ohio. Uh, take it from there. Did you, get, did you grow up in Norwood or did you move? I was actually born in the city of Norwood. It's kind of interesting uh, as it relates to the service because, um, because I was born in a home setting and not a hospital situation. On the date of birth uh, that I was supposedly given by my parents was wow. April the 27th. It wasn't until that I uh, had occasion to uh, go into the service and I actually joined at 17 that there was the need for my birth certificate. So I go to the health department in the city of Norwood to obtain my birth certificate for the recruiters. And I look upon the birth certificate and realize that I have been told by my parents the wrong birthday. <clears throat> How did that happen? Well, being born in a home setting and in the excitement of being born, yes. uh, the only one that was cognizant of the time of the day was the doctor. And three minutes after midnight, I was born on April the 28th. So my parents, in the excitement, it was continued to tell me that my birthday was April the 27th. So What'd on documentation do? <laughs> for my driver's license, for Social Security, oh up until God. the age of 17, when I went and got my birth certificate, I realized not only was, according to my parents, <laughs> born on the wrong day, but the wrong name. My what? parents, My parents had the indication that they wanted me to have the spelling of Gary as G-A-R-Y. The physician filled out the birth certificate as G-A-R-R-Y. So not only did I have the wrong name, but I had the wrong birthday. That might be the wildest story well, I've ever heard in the beginning well, of an what, interview. Well, what, what happened was that then in the ensuing years, I took the measures to go ahead yeah. and get it addressed as far as through Social Security, get my driver's license changed from April the 27th to April the 28th. And most recently, uh, there's a procedure that you can follow with the state of Ohio to amend your birth certificate that I had my name legally corrected to be not G-A-R-R-Y as indicated on my birth certificate, but G-A-R-Y. But you could not change the date. I could not, well, the okay. date was what it was. You but but I, see, I would not have known this until the time. Do you still celebrate the, the 27th most years? <laughs> I could celebrate both maybe if I wanted to. <laughs> but I choose to go with the proper one of April the 28th. Just not so, the first 17 years. Not the wow. first 17 years I did. That's so, wild. So, but I owe that to the military <laughs> because of the fact that yeah. had I not gone and got my driver's or went and got my birth certificate, mm -hmm. I would not have known these facts. So. Okay. So, what was your parents doing in Norwood? What was your upbringing? well, my uh, my father, uh, uh, they were uh, he was a lifelong resident of Norwood. Uh, my mother relocated there as a young girl from Indiana. And at the time of my birth, my dad was employed with the Alice Chalmers Corporation, which was right there in the uh, city of Norwood. So, uh, and my mother at that time was a stay-at-home mom. So, so, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I uh, continue to reside in Norwood. Um, even once I got out of the service, I uh, lived there afterwards for a period of about 12 years as well until uh, my wife and I at that point relocated. So I have a long history with, with the city of Norwood, graduated from the Norwood school system and, and all that, so. So you said you were 17 when you graduated high school? Uh, well, what it was is that I was actually 17 when I enlisted, and this kind of takes us into the service part. Um, we'll, we'll kind of address that. The fact that um, uh, as I went through high school, I took at the time what was called college preparatory subjects. I had every intention as a young man to go ahead on to college. Well, in 1966, the Vietnam War was heating up mm -hmm. quite heavily. Uh, the draft was in place to where young men that did not have uh, uh, perhaps the, the college deferment thing that you were subject to being drafted into the service. Mm -hmm. Well, upon exploring my options out of high school and realizing that I nor my parents had the resources to send me on to college, I was looking at the prospect that if I was in the workforce, it would only be a matter of time until perhaps I was drafted into the service. Mm -hmm. And this was. Uh, 
Uh, so you figured better to choose where you I'm go. better to choose. And also, I did not want to go uh, into one of the branches that might be involved in the conflict, either, uh, either as a Marine or the Army. And they were drafting Marines, uh, people mm -hmm. for the Marine Corps at the time, largely due to my uncle, my dad's brother. And what that, why this comes about, because uh, my dad's brother uh, was a veteran of World War II. Louis, Louis Coifer was his name. Um, and to a young man at the time, he was just a very strange person. And what we will now deem to be post-traumatic stress disorder is apparently what my uncle suffered from. It wasn't until later in life that, uh, as I talked to relatives, that I realized that uh, what all that he had gone through in World War II, and uh, later on I come to find out that he was really quite a remarkable man mm -hmm. in his service career because he was highly awarded. Uh, he was wounded. He saw a lot of major conflicts and uh, in the European theater. Uh, was rewarded two silver stars for his heroism. But unfortunately, uh, when he came back as a young man from the war, he was a very scarred individual. Uh, he was in and out of veterans' homes quite frequently, and he dealt with his issues both mentally and physically with the use of alcohol. Your dad was older, I take it, or younger? My dad was a little bit older than him, but my dad uh, got a deferment, was not eligible to go into World War II because he had suffered a severe trauma to his leg. He broke it in three places, and they deemed him not physical able for World War II. And, and I know that bothered him, the fact that he had uh, two brothers that, that were in the service at the time. But like I say, I, would, I saw what happened to my Uncle Lou. You know, and it really would concern me that if I was to go into a conflict or something like that, and even if I survived it, there's a guy that was dealing with both not only physical things but mental issues. And so I thought that. You okay, really? No. Uh, I'm okay. Right. If I can get that, if you get that pain off, uh, okay. I got a bone apparently turned over and it ain't supposed to. <laughs> I was just getting a little worried about you. All right, continue on. <laughs> but, but like I said, I, due to my uncle's experience, I, I had an aversion, you might say, to wanting to deal with the conflict. So I began, even as a young man, and I look back now that I was probably pretty mature at the time, to think about, okay, Gary, what's your options? What's the best return on your investment mm -hmm. of time? So I explored both the Air Force and the Navy. I spoke to the recruiters. Now, this is when I'm... No uh, history there. You really didn't know anybody from the Navy or the Air Force. Right. Well, as a uncle as a, my uncle guy. was an Army yeah. guy, but I had uh, an uncle by marriage. My mom's sister had married a gentleman who was a veteran of World War II, my Uncle Jim, okay. who attributed uh, a lot of his success in life to the training that he got in the Navy. Okay. He was an electrician, mm -hmm. and so he would often embellish stories of his military career, and <laughs> they were amusing and funny and interesting and stuff, and so I thought, okay, the Navy really sounds like an interesting place to, to go. Mm -hmm. And seeing also how he benefited from the training that he got, and after talking to both the Air Force and the Navy recruiter, I determined that I thought my Navy was the best course, especially once I went and took a battery of tests with the Navy, and the recruiter could assure me that I was going to get one of the better schools that I had done well enough on the test. Now, this was all taking place when I was just midway through my senior year in high school. Well, needless to say, uh, the elective branches of the service, like the Air Force and the Navy, were highly sought after by guys trying to avoid yes. the draft. And so you might say there was like a waiting list to get in. So the recruiter, uh, upon getting the results of my test, promised me I would get a better quality school, said, one way to ensure you getting in in a timely manner was, would be for you to enlist as soon as you can. And I said, well, how soon may I enlist? He said, well, let's look at it this way. He said, uh, if we were to swear you in in March, shortly after you graduated from high school in June, you could go right into active duty. And so I said, sounds like a plan to me. But being only 17, I had to go get my birth certificate. So that's when that all came about, going to the recruiter. Well, so you started school early, though, technically. You well, were always gonna graduate, right? I was going to graduate just slightly yeah. after I turned 18 years old. Oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> so upon deciding to do this, because I was only 17, uh, the recruiter said, well, we'll need <clears throat> the uh, permission of your parents as well. And so I went home, and I shared with my parents the fact that I've chosen to go into the Navy. I took tests. They promised me a good school. And but at 17, that one or both of you would have to go and sign the papers. And my dad was readily agreeable to do that. So the very next day after uh, high school, I went down to tell the recruiter that I'd spoken to my parents. Recruiter got rather a big smile on his face. I said, well, what's so funny? He said, 
When I opened the office up at 8 o'clock this morning, he said your dad was signing, standing outside ready to sign the papers. So apparently he was that eager to make sure that he got, <laughs> got, got rid of you. <laughs> that was good. I think no, he was quite proud of the yeah, fact that, yeah. that I went. He was always proud of my service. But like I say, I spoke to him that evening at 8 o'clock the next morning. He was awaiting the recruiter to sign Do the papers. Do you paper, think it so was also, too, he didn't want to? He didn't want to have what happened to his brother. I mean, he saw yes, that. Yes, I, I, yes, I think, that I, I think so yeah, as well, yes. See that so it was that on March 30, or I should say March 21st of 1966, I was actually officially sworn into the Navy Reserves. And the plan was that I was to go to boot camp shortly after graduating in June from Norwood High School. Well, in the meantime, I had spoken to a couple of my buddies in high school about what I was going to do, and it was interesting to them to do as well. So we actually kind of developed a buddy plan. Nice. I, the fact that there were the other two gentlemen and myself were basically all going to go to boot camp and go together. Well, just prior to all three of us leaving, shortly after graduation, I get a recall from the recruiter saying, I have a tremendous favor to ask. He said, I've got a young gentleman here that one of the other branches are about ready to grab. And by hook and crook, I can slide him in so he won't have to go. He said, if you'll provide a slot for him. I said, well, when am I going to go? Yeah. He said, a month later in July. Could you do that for me? And so I wouldn't be able to go with my buddies and go through boot camp, but as a favor of the recruiter who had really been a good guy to me, I said, I'll do that. So my other buddies took off at the end of June to go to boot camp. I followed the next month. And of course, gave me another opportunity to be with my high school sweetheart for another month. So, you know, so it wasn't such a bad deal. As it turned out, uh, on uh, July 21st, I uh, at that point was sworn in to active duty in Cincinnati, and at that point I went to the Great Lakes uh, Naval Training Center in Illinois to begin boot camp. And as it turned out, uh, I wasn't there very long at all that they realized that I had an issue, and that was that my vision was not correct for the glasses. So when I was initially signed to my first outfit to be with, I was held back in what they called a holding company. So had I gone with my two friends, the same scenario would have happened to me Whoa. that in short order, they would have gone on and I would have been held so back. So those two guys were already gone. They were, they gone were already gone. I did have the occasion that so far into boot camp that I was able to connect with them and say, how you guys doing, that kind of stuff. So briefly, <laughs> I did see them on one scenario. As it turned out in the long run, one of the gentlemen never did make it through the military career. I'm not sure of the circumstance, whether he ran into a, a medical issue or mm -hmm. what may have transpired. Now, the other gentleman did do his four years of service. Mm -hmm. I saw him briefly on one occasion, but I didn't have the opportunity to talk to him about what his experiences were. Mm -hmm. So, but um, once I got into boot camp, uh, as I say, I was probably there longer than most uh, boot camp people would be because of the vision issue and I was put into what's called a holding company until they could get the glasses made. So there was a whole group of us that came in there that was maybe initially assigned to a particular outfit only to realize you've got problems with so your you paperwork, you've got a glasses, meta issue. Right? You had never really realized you had vision issues? But no, I, I had glasses, but they weren't correct to the correct okay. lens. You know, when I did the eye check, uh -huh. well, you're, you're not seeing as well yeah. as you could. We need to hold you back till you get your glasses made. So eventually, I was probably in boot camp probably about a week to two weeks longer because of being held up to be in this what's called holding company. And the holding company was eventually made into a squadron. And this happens to be my outfit, which is Company 479. And all these particular gentlemen and this particular thing, for one reason or another, we were misfits, you might say. The fact that we, we were the last company put together in this larger group and unfortunately, we were the last ones to eventually be mustered out after we were done with the training. So we were there a little bit longer than most of them. What would they be? But how did the, you make out in training? How were you as a... Well, actually, it was uh, uh, not a hardship for me because I had actually... I mentioned earlier about having lived in Norwood all my life, which was really not quite true. Because um, for a period of time, actually two years, when I graduated from high school, uh, my sister and her husband had come here from California. And as a young couple, they left Norwood in about 1960, gone to California, had two small children right away, and were really struggling to make a go of it, and they weren't doing so well. So on a trip back here in the summer of 62, they got a brainstorming idea, the fact that, well, there's Gary, 
what if we were to ask mom and dad and ask Gary if he would be interested in coming to California and basically being our nanny? So they propositioned me and my parents, and for a young man who had never been out of the tri-state area to go to California, well, yeah, I'll go. So off I went. So my first um, two years of high school, I lived in uh, Costa Mesa, California. Uh -huh. Uh, was basically the nanny to their two small kids, helped them financially get back on their feet. And then after a two-year period, I came back between my uh, sophomore and junior year of high school to visit family and friends. And the young lady that lived four houses down the street from me that I had known since I was eight years old and we had attended school together, she was a year younger than me, had turned into this beautiful woman. Just beautiful. You had just been gone two years. I'd just been gone two years, and she had just matured into this beautiful woman. So needless to say, I spent the entire summer uh, in the company of this young lady, understanding that I'd made the promise to family that I would return to California, which I did. And you did. And I lasted one month. Uh. <laughs> so upon one month, I then returned to uh, Norwood, Ohio, to attend Norwood High School for my junior and senior year. And they were doing better. They didn't need you. At the they were doing there, much better at that time. And so the young lady, uh, we became high school sweethearts, and she was my wife for 42 and a half years, you know. Amazing. So, yes, so it was, uh, so that's what had transpired. But like I say, uh, to get back to the boot camp thing, some guys were probably having issues with perhaps being away from home for the very first time. But me having kind of gone through that and adjusting, and I just found it fascinating, the fact that uh, there I was within the boot camp meeting all these people of different cultures, different backgrounds, people from New York, rural people, and I just, throughout my life I found people interesting, I've been a people person, and so I just found the whole experience just amazing. Were you, you know? the only one in that picture from Ohio? Or? Well, you know, I think back now, uh, and uh, with difficulty thinking about were there any guys at that venue that we kind of connected home-wise? But I, as I remember, not. I mean, there, there may have been, but we just didn't connect on that level. I mean, our days, Navy boot camp certainly is not like the Army or the Marine Corps to the degree that they're difficult and that kind of stuff. In the scheme of things, my understanding would be certainly Marine Corps would be t the hardest, uh -huh. then the Army, yeah. perhaps the Navy, then the Air Force. I mean, yes, it was physically demanding at, at times, and it certainly filled your schedule up. You know, but it wasn't um, uh, anything at all like them. But uh, yes, sir. In boot camp, did you have to go to the rifle range? They did not emphasize that very much at all in the Navy. I mean, we did do some type of weaponry training. Mm -hmm. As I recall, we shot like a 45 pistol okay. and an M1 rifle, so and you that did was shoot the M1. Then. So that was about the extent Peep. of it, but very briefly, knowing that you probably wouldn't have yeah, the need to do that very often. <laughs> Peep sites or telescopes? Just, just the peep sites is what we yeah. did. They, they just basically taught you the fundamentals of the weaponry, mm -hmm. feeling as though if you found yourself in some position like as a shore patrol or something, you would get additional training. Yeah. The things that they kind of stressed in the Navy were the appropriate things such as water safety, water mm -hmm. survival, things of that nature. Okay. That, that was the thing that was kind of emphasized there. Yes, they did, but that was interesting. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that, uh, one of the interesting stories I think about in boot camp one time was when it came to that particular point of basically simulating you jumping off the bow of a ship mm -hmm. and demonstrating your prowess to be able to swim. Well, most of the guys going through there, they weren't going to man up and say, I don't know how to swim. You just figure, I'll do the best that I can. But you could tell by the body language as we climbed these stairways, and it was probably the equivalent of a two or three story Granted, I had never really jumped off anything quite that high in my <laughs> life. I mean, you weren't asked to dive, you were basically asked to jump. So as you, as you got up there, you know, we were all somewhat fearful to do it, and you just jumped down. Now, they had, they had had the precaution in this pool to have men with long poles with lanyard devices on there <laughs> that should you run into trouble, that they could lend you a hand. And you could tell as you got up to the platform the guys that were reluctant to do it. And when you got to that point, they basically threw you off if oh, you didn't volunteer man. to do it. <laughs> and one of the remarkable stories that I remember one time was this one particular gentleman who was terrified by his body language <clears throat> was thrown off the platform, lands in the water and begins to frail, you know, you know, and then all of a sudden realize, I can swim. I can swim. 
And this guy begins to dog paddle around and he's yelling, I can swim, I can swim. And they're saying, yeah, get out of there. And they're not exactly using that language. But they're chasing him around with this lanyard device, wanting him to get out of there so the next guy could jump off the platform. But he's dog paddling around, I can swim, I can swim, I can swim. You know, so eventually they were able to corral him and get him out of there. But that was just one of the, one of the many things that, uh, that you experienced. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a real eye-opener and a, and, a, and a wonderful experience. And I was there from uh, July 21st and finally got out in October the 13th. And uh, what was interesting about the uh, Navy boot camp is that um, midway through there, you kind of stop all training and you do what they call like a service week function. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, they assign you to some task to support the other guys. And in my case, I wound up in the galley, basically. Okay. I didn't get to prepare food, I got to clean up food. So I found myself in the lowest of low places in what was called the scullery, basically cleaning all the big pots and pans. And I tell you, it was probably one of the hardest things because with people coming and going and utilizing the, um, the galley facilities there both night and day, those were some really long, hard days that you put in. I mean, you would basically go back and maybe get four or five hours sleep only to go back again and be back in the scullery and. I mean, you know, hot, wet, just wet all the time, that kind of stuff. Did they call that KP in the Navy? They did. Well, it was referred to as that, but yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah. Okay. But, but gallery, gallery duty was another one. But okay. the thing about the Navy, uh, various parts of your training and experience, you would oftentimes have to do service work, uh, you know, especially when you're at the low end of your enlistment until you achieve your rating. But um, Yes, once I finished my uh, boot camp service, I then was assigned to, um, and as a recruiter had promised me, uh, I got an excellent school. I uh, got electronics school. Uh, was that from your testing, pre-testing? Yes, okay. and, and we did some additional testing in boot camp as well. They did right. a lot more extensive testing at that point. So, so you uh, knew you were going to qualify for that. Yeah, I knew that I was very fortunate to qualify for a very good school. Mm -hmm. So from there, uh, after about two weeks home on leave, uh, I was sent to the Naval Air Training Center in Millington, Tennessee, which is just outside of Memphis. And for a period there, I initially went to what was called Avian Aviation or Avionics Fundamental School. And this happens to be a picture of the graduating guys with me. Now, this was a quite extensive school. This was like 16 weeks long. Now, some of those guys were there. I've taken one no, or two. Not, no, not to my knowledge. Wow. Okay. You know, the fact that when, when we one. got orders, again, I'm trying to think yeah. back. Did any of my paths ever cross with any of these guys? And sadly, I can't say wow, that they did. That's wild. You know, can't yeah. think that they do. You all went to different schools. All the different schools. Like okay. I say, the guys in my boot camp, they have, they have gone from everything to uh, advanced schools like avionics to, to who knows. becoming yeah. commissary guys, yeah. cooks, <laughs> different things. But these are the guys that I attended uh, the avionics fundamental school, which was a 16-week program. And at that time, it largely covered uh, what we know as um, – the fundamentals of avionics or, or electronics, which was like AC and DC theory of electric, uh, vacuum tubes, uh, the advent of semi semiconductors were just coming on at that time in the 60s, uh, radar, computers, the use of oscilloscopes, just the basics of electronics. And those were the guys there. And within this picture, you'll notice that there are some Marines. Mm -hmm. So the Marines, although they don't like to think they're a division of the Navy, uh, throughout my training in the service, many times I did go through training with Marine guys because they had an air wing and all that kind of stuff of their own as well. But after, after completion of that fundamental school, which was 16 weeks long, I then went into what was called the Aviation Electronic uh, Technician Program, again in Millington from uh, April of 1966 to June of 1967. And this was just uh, basic class having to do about troubleshooting on basic equipment and that kind of stuff. Uh, once I was finished with school, I was then allowed to uh, go home for uh, about two week leave. And then I was assigned to go to the Norf Norfolk Naval Air Station. I reported there on July 1967 and again for additional training on specific equipment. And as it turned out, my rating, I was designated uh, an ATN which was an aviation electronics technician in meaning navigation. 
So equipment related to navigation and communications like radios was my specialty. There might Any be guys like the Charlie School going, or again you're separated. Well, again I'm kind of separated. Okay. The fact right. guys just go in, in different uh -huh. different directions, but uh, that kind of designates what your area of thing. And mine was communications. So throughout the rest of my career, this program that I attended in Norfolk uh, had me uh, specialized training on communications equipment is what I worked on there. Where you could. Dick worked on down, radio equipment. It, so finally, on September the 16th of 1967, I was assigned a squadron. I was finally giving orders that I was going to be with a unit. Okay. And the unit to where I was assigned was patrol squadron, or designated VP-26 out of Brunswick, Maine. So in September of 1967, I joined the uh, patrol squadron 26 in Brunswick, Maine. Did you get leave from Virginia again to go I did back not. home? <coughs> I did not at okay, that point. <coughs> Did you think about bringing your girlfriend? Did you know you were? Well, back then that was not appropriate as far as. Oh, okay. So you were <laughs> and certainly to, within her you family. You were close to being married. No, no. We, 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 uh, my intent was to simply, we knew that we were going to marry each other. My intent was simply to wait until I got out of the service. Okay. Gotcha. And, and that was what, fine with her parents as well. You know, the fact that. You guys that, were still just 19, right? <clears throat> yes, 18, yes. I was right. just 19 years old and she was okay. just 18, just out of high school. And so we, we had a little bit of growing up to do. But we, we were devoted to each other. I mean, you know, as a young guy in the service, I was always very faithful to my then girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, it wasn't a matter that I messed around or anything like that. So the, uh, my, uh, once I joined VP 26 in September, uh, my stay in Brunswick was short lived. <laughs> because uh, on November, basically a month later in 1967, the squadron went on a deployment. And uh, the deployment was much like a ship that was shipped out to do its duties. Uh, our duty as a patrol squadron normally was to do anti-submarine warfare tasks. Uh, because we were in Brunswick, Maine, <coughs> largely our duties were to patrol the North Atlantic, basically looking for enemy submarines, mainly Russian submarines. Our planes were designed with very sophisticated electronic gear uh, to, to be able to detect the metal hull of submarines. Uh, here happens to be a picture of one of our planes. It might not show up, but on the back here is a rather long extension on the back of the plane. And this is what's called the magnetic anomaly detection device. It's a very strong electromagnetic radar type thing that when they dropped like sauna buoys, which would give off signals. And with the use of this, they could pick up and more or less detect where submarines were at. Well, in the fall of 67, uh, that's not what we were going to do. We weren't deployed to go at some point and look for submarines. We were deployed to Sangley Point, the Philippines, and we also had a detachment in Utapau, Thailand. And our task then was to patrol the Gulf of Tonkin and look for surface craft that was perhaps uh, contributing to the war effort by bringing in weaponry or other supplies from coastal areas in and around Vietnam to supply the Viet Cong. And the protocol at that time, basically for our craft, <coughs> we had no ordnance on our planes. And the protocol, because we were somewhat new at this, <coughs> was basically by the use of our radar to find the surface craft. And much of this was done at night. And once the surface craft was detected, <clears throat> the plane would then fly down to an altitude of less than a thousand feet to visually be able to determine what type of craft this might be. That's crazy. They were putting you guys in, in sitting ducks, right? I mean, I Basically. So <laughs> then, oftentimes at night, with the use of a million power spotlight, a million candle power spotlight, <laughs> they would be able to illuminate what type of surface craft was there. Then if it was something to be further explored with the use of very bright flares, they could drop flares and further explore what was going on. So that's basically was our mission to determine, you know, these type of surface craft. How do you guys feel craft. about this mission? I mean, you guys well, didn't you, realize you, you, you were at risk. Well, you kind of have to understand, I need to kind of go back a little bit. Yes. But upon joining the squadron, I was part of the squadron and I wasn't. And let me explain yes. that. The fact that upon joining the squadron, each squadron has to contribute manpower in support of the base that they're stationed at. So you didn't necessarily have to go up every time, right? Well, no, I was not. I tried. 
uh, that was the glory part as far as once you got into p patrol squadron, yeah. often a young man like me strived for the fact of being part of the air crew. You know, wow, that, they did all the travel, they did all the excitement. Yeah. I so much wanted to be a part of the air crew. Yeah. But as it turned out, I was tested uh, to be a part of the air crew, and once again, my vision failed me. You know, I was unacceptable to be a part of the air crew. So I was basically referred to then as the ground pounder. Uh -huh. I was yeah. one of the people that did service work on the grounds, yeah. servicing the plane. That's what I would have done had I remained in the squadron. But as I mentioned, each squadron had to contribute to the support of the base. And each base had what they call an aircraft maintenance division. And you kind of have to understand that within the squadron, when they would have like, say, a radio communications issue with a plane, all this communication stuff was in a series of black boxes. The radio was in one black box. The power supply was in another black box. The coupler that made it fit properly with the antenna was within another black box. So. The electronic technicians within the squadron, when they had a radio communications problem, basically were just switching out black boxes to readily fix the problem. At the point that the black box was determined to be bad, it had to be repaired. It was then sent to the base aircraft maintenance division, which I was a part of, that then did the intricate troubleshooting. So my job was not working with the squadron fellows and their day-to-day -day task. Mm -hmm. But I was rather at another facility altogether in which I did the detailed troubleshooting of replacing circuitry, individual components, things of that nature. And throughout my career, as the squadron went to different deployments, later to Road of Spain, later to Keflavik, Iceland, I wasn't assigned to the squadron, but rather I was detached to the aircraft maintenance division. So oftentimes a young guy that might be new to the squadron someday in the uh, locker room or something, you kind of see him looking out of the corner of the eye at you like, well, who is this guy? I never see this guy at the squadron, but he's living here. So someone would eventually explain to him, well, yes, he's part of the squadron, but he works at a different division. They didn't quite understand how it worked. Yeah, yeah. And most, in our particular case, there were like a half a dozen of us electronic technicians that weren't a part of the day-to-day -day operation at the squadrons, yeah. but rather we worked at the AMD facility. So did it kind of make you feel a little isolated? Like, did you have some camaraderie mm -hmm. with the guy? See, you, you did feel isolated in a way, the fact that you weren't oftentimes up on the day-to-day -day things that occurred in the squadron until you got back to the barracks. And again, those weren't necessarily your buds yeah. in a way because, you know, yeah. you didn't work and interact with them. Uh, yeah. So the advantage in a way was the fact that you not only got to know the people in your squadron to a certain degree, but you got to know a lot of the base people. And sometimes yeah. when you went to a foreign venue, that was very advantageous. The fact that, you know, when I was stationed in Rota, Spain, or I was stationed in the Philippines, the fact that you would uh, make friends with some of these people who resided like on base housing and say, would you like to come to my house for a home-cooked meal? And I say, would I? <laughs> would I? So it really had its, had its amenities. Or the fact that they had been there for a long period of time, they know the locale very well. Sometimes they'd say, like when I was in Rota, Spain, uh, one of the gentlemen I got to know was kind enough to invite me and some of the other guys to a vacation home they had on the Mediterranean. Well, you know, that was pretty nice too. You know, so it had its advantages and its disadvantages to it, but uh, it gave me the opportunity, like I say, to be um, a partnership not only to the squadron but also in support of the base and meet, meet a wide variety of different people. So, now, but who was your direct commander? Did you have? Well, once I was assigned to the AMD, that was the officer to whom I worked for. Was, was that there. Actually, I had to serve two masters, and sometimes it was really a disadvantage, the fact that when they would have inspections or formal affairs, I would still have to be a part of what went on in the squadron, yeah. and I would still have to be a part of what went on at the base. So sometimes on major inspections where the squadron would get by with doing one, I'd have to do two, you know. Or sometimes what would happen also is that not only in the Navy did you have assigned duties, and that wasn't all that you did. There was also formal duty that you would have to serve above and beyond your normal job. You might have to be a watch. You might have to be a part of a duty officer somewhere. And when I was assigned with the AMD, I had to take on the duties that they would assign me from time to time. And what was interesting, when I was in Iceland, I was basically assigned to be uh, the duty officer, you might say, on the bus. And the bus 
would go around and uh, there were dependent children and they'd get kind of rowdy and all that kind of stuff. But it got to a point to where they realized they needed someone with some formal authority to be on the bus. So for four hours a day, I would get on and ride around and basically be the, uh, the bus police to make sure that the kids behaved themselves on the bus as part of my, part of my duty. So, but, uh, but yes, once we uh, went to Sangley Point, and as I say, upon getting there, I was assigned to the uh, Aircraft Maintenance Division. And what was interesting about our uh, duty uh, over there, uh, unfortunately, in talking about what our duty was, we lost initially one of our planes on February the 6th, 1968, uh, air crew number eight uh, was lost. Uh, they sent out planes to look for it. Uh, eventually, uh, it was, uh, they found a raft which indicated that the plane had crashed in water. But my understanding was, again, not being in the loop of what went on necessarily in the squadron, but my understanding was is that uh, in time they were able to recover parts or some of the individuals from the crash but all 11 service members were lost, and that was uh, four officers and eight enlisted men. And what was scary about that uh, prospect was the fact that because our patrols were largely visual, we had the opportunities, meaning me as a ground pounder, I couldn't qualify for an air crew, that they would solicit volunteers. They had a couple of, uh, as, you, as indicated on here, you could see some little observation windows on these planes. So they would have seats available for volunteers that would be willing to fly on the aircraft to serve as just observation Observers. volunteers. Of course, you would also be running back and forth to serve people coffee or doing other things like this. But what it allowed you was that because these flights took place in the combat zone, for that particular month, you were entitled to tax-free money, pay combat pay. pay. You could get paid. So you could, could do that? You did. I signed up. I signed up and do that. In fact, uh, in that month of, um, I think it was December and January, uh, I, I went out uh, on the plane. And um, this is when you were in Iceland. No, this this was what was going Bad on in Sang. Ago. No, this was what was going on in Sangley Point now right, when okay. we went out. So I was actually going out on the patrols with them on occasion, once maybe twice a month. But once they lost the plane, they then said, "Listen." No one but non-essential personnel on the plane. Because some guys died, I take it, right? Some guys unnecessarily died. And an interesting story Did is you know one of them. them personally? Yes. And one, one of them was uh, uh, this particular, particular gentleman died for love. You kept mentioning, did, did I know any yeah. people or things like that? This particular gentleman joined our squadron just before we left to go to Sangley Point, Philippines. He was a career guy, had been in 12 years. And I was thinking to myself, he was an aviation technician like myself, you know, why would a guy join to go right back overseas again? Most guys would desire to spend their time stateside. He had fallen in love. He had been over in the Philippine Islands with a previous squadron and met a Filipino lady that he had fallen in love with. So being a 12-year veteran, he called the people that he knew and said, listen, I need to get back to the Philippine Islands. Is there some way I can get back? And they said, Patrol Squadron 26. They're about ready to go back. Would you want to go with him? Yes, transfer me to it. So he joined up with us to go back to Patrol Squadron 26, and we uh, developed a relationship because he was from Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, and we would talk about familiar places that we knew and things of that nature. Where was and, he from, do you remember? Uh, exactly in Cincinnati, I do not know. Uh, but as it turned out, that first plane that was lost, he, like the rest of us, was looking for some extra money he was on that plane today, not as part of that crew, but as the observation guy. So I often think about the consequences that, first of all, because of love, brought him to our squadron, brought him back to the Philippines. On that day, on that plane, he found himself in the wrong position to where he died. You they know? never determined what happened? On the first plane, no. Then what occurred uh, on January, uh, 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 let me take this back here. What occurred then on April the 1st, 1968, we definitely had another plane lost, and we know that to be shot down. Shot down in basically the same location. These guys were able to visually uh, see what transpired, and uh, we have reason to think now that it was actually the Cambodian Army that did it. Uh, they, they saw a surface craft. They approached it. 
from their description, it sounded very much like one of the personnel landing craft that they had acquired from, you know, one of the countries that they used for whatever purpose. They had retrofitted this with a large 50 caliber machine gun, and upon our plane coming down to investigate it, they opened fire on them. They uh, were able to set fire to one of the engines. They tried everything they could to amend putting the fire out. Couldn't do it. They knew they were in hostile waters, and to ditch the plane would run the risk of perhaps being captured. So the pilot erred on the side of, see if I can make it to land. There's an airfield 20 miles away. The plane's on fire. They're communicating with everyone what's going on. The plane is going there. It looks like the prospects are good. They're going to be able to get the plane. When he suddenly begins to make a bank to do the proper, the, wind, the wing basically tears off the plane. It crashes and everyone is killed. So during that tour of duty, like I said, uh, and our squadron wasn't really all that big. We lost like 24 guys. And we have reason now to think that probably that was what the demise of the first plane was, was the fact that uh, you know, it was shot down basically in the same location. And uh, what was interesting during our tour of duty there were some other things that really occurred during uh, November 67 and June of 68 was the fact that the uh, Tet Offensive took place. Uh, the, uh, the Pueblo incident occurred with North Korea. So we were thinking in the back of our mind with all this that was going on and everything that we were going to be extended. You know, there was just so much going on at the time and it was pretty hectic. Uh, Quezon was under siege so it may have made a big news story normally but with the loss of our planes and yet all this other information going on it was never really covered to any degree at all about the loss of life to, to that degree and the Cambodians possibly being responsible for it. So. But yeah, it was, uh, it was a real growing up period for me at that time to, you know, to have interact with people. Uh, granted, because of my duties, kind of being away from the squadron, I didn't know some of these guys to the degree that, that I'm sure a lot of the other guys did, but yeah. still they were people that I knew from, from the club and how you doing and what's going on, but not on a very personal level with the exception of the one gentleman. So. But uh, it was then, like I say, in uh, June that we returned. Uh, to uh, Brunswick, Maine, uh, and the Navy was all the time. Uh, were you communicating back home when you were in Vietnam? Like, how, what was that like? Well, yes. Uh, the fact. Well, it, it that's an interesting question. Uh, not long ago, and I, I do volunteer work with the hospice organization that served my wife, and there was a lady in there uh, who we never had the pleasure of meeting. Suddenly, uh, sends me an email one day and said, "Would you be kind enough?" I understand that you're a very nice gentleman to help my daughter with a project that she has. Her daughter was a high school student and within their circle of family and friends they did not know one single veteran. And her daughter's task was to interview a veteran. So her daughter submitted to me about 20 questions, very interesting questions, Maybe and, these same ones. <laughs> and I answered them in great detail. I had the occasion a number of months later to meet the lady, meet her daughter. And I said, hey, by the way, how did you do on your high school project? She said, I got an A. And she said, but I got a question for you. She said, what was the most interesting question that I asked you? I said, easy. I said, when you asked me about how it was that I communicated with family and friends. And I said, and this is where I feel sorry for you. And she said, me? I said, think about it. I said, at the time that I was corresponding with uh, my then girlfriend, later my wife, and my parents, they, uh, they had the goodwill to keep all my correspondence. Are you and I, a child? Beg your pardon? Is your brother or sister? I, I have siblings, yes. Yeah. But I largely just corresponded to mom and dad. Mom and, dad yeah. and they let kids know what was going on. And religiously, I corresponded with my girlfriend. And I, and like I say, I would, these letters were like journals in a diary. I would write about what I did that day, people I interacted with, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And in sharing with her why I feel sorry for her, her because I say now whenever the mood strikes me and both my parents and my wife saved all the correspondence I can go upstairs to a bedroom and a large trunk is all that correspondence so when the mood strikes me I can pull out a letter and I can reflect back about then that place those people and I to the young girl I said well that's where I feel sorry for you and she said me I said yeah I said think about how you would correspond with a young suitor or someone Facebook. today you would do Facebook, you would do emails. Perhaps it might be up in the cloud yeah, 30 probably. years from now, but you wouldn't have that good fortune like <laughs> I have to have all that stuff up here. She said, you're right. So I said, I have all those memories. But yeah, largely it was correspondence. Uh, once in a while, on rare occasions, you gotta remember, no cell phones, no internet. 
Once in a while you could correspond or deal with a ham operator. They would set this up to where a ham operator, and granted this was not personal at all, a ham operator, you'd get on the phone, they would get stateside somewhere like a link of ham operators mm -hmm. to connect you with a loved one. And of course all these people were listening so you kind of had to keep it, you know, <laughs> not too personal but still it was just great to hear someone's voice. So I would call my, on the rare occasion it, it presented itself, I would call my then girlfriend or my parents. But perhaps during like a six, a six month deployment, maybe once or twice you would have that opportunity uh, to do that. pretty rare. Pretty rare. So yeah. So. When you were assigned to this duty with uh, whatever we're talking about on the air support yes. thing, what kind of money did you make per month? Not very much. But you got to understand your needs were very limited from the, I think, I don't know, Forty dollars, fifty dollars, something like that. One of the one of the burdens a I month? had. A month? Yeah, something like that. Well, one of the burdens I had at the time is that coming from a large extended family, as any young man would, I wanted a car, and oh, my parents oh, said, oh, "I don't have an issue with that. <laughs> Buy yourself a car," and so I did. <laughs> I bought myself a car, and upon going into the service, I I I couldn't use it. I didn't have the resources for it. So the car stayed at home back in Norwood, but I still had to pay for the car. Yeah. So that kind of limited my, my cash flow. But like I said, the service provided just about all your needs in terms of housing, and money, you know, food and all that kind of stuff. Well, I was so wanting to compare the monthly overseas pay with mine in 1945. I think I made about 130 bucks a month as staff sergeant in 45. Now, you fast forward another 20 years there, what well, you you all, huh? well I, I've always been a good saver, and yes, I was. I mean, I basically just got the money allocated to me that I thought that I would need. Kind of like self-control. As long as I don't have the money, I'm not going to spend it, you know. So, but I like spent all mine on, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and it was an interesting thing about that car that was at home is the fact that because my dad resided and worked right in the city of Norwood, I grew up not having the need for an automobile. I, we didn't have a car when I was a kid because all the amenities we wanted were right there in the city of Norwood. Doctors, local shopping, family. And so uh, at the point that I went in the service, my dad began to entertain the idea. I got this nice car just sitting there in the garage. <laughs> Maybe I'll think about getting my license again. So all of a sudden, well, my car became their car. So, <laughs> What kind of a car? It was a 1961 Volkswagen Bug. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. So once we, uh, once we came back from Sangley, uh, we were stateside and normally our rotation would be like six to seven months overseas, six to seven months back in the States. But uh, during that particular time, uh, they would often have... Uh, this was 69 or 68? This is 68 now. I returned in June of 68. Uh, and so uh, what happened is that because a lot of the married guys, the dependent guys, had already spent six months overseas, they often had billets in schools that they had to fill, you know, to show like continuing education, that kind of stuff. So at one point they said, well, don't get too comfortable because we're going to be sending you off to school as a single guy. And I said, really? I just got back. No, nope, we're going to send you off to school. So uh, it wasn't a very lengthy school, but I did have the opportunity to go to Patuxent River, Maryland, in September of 68 until October of 68, which I went to for additional training. And at that point, that kind of was the end of my training in the service, but that's when I went. What were you learning there, do you remember? Actually, they had sent me for a school that I really shouldn't have been sent to, but they needed to fill a billet, you know, Absolutely. to be in good standing. <laughs> and they actually sent me, where normally I deal on navigational and uh, communications equipment, this was actually a radar school. So, but it wasn't. You never had to use it. Right? I never had to use it, but they 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 wanted to be in good standing to say that just we yes. sent people to the school and keep the billet open for future training and that kind of stuff. Well, our next uh, rotation was to go to Rota, Spain, and so in November of 1968 we deployed to go uh, to to Rota, Spain, and I and for a moment here I'll kind of talk about uh, the Philippines. Rota, Spain, and Keflavik, Iceland. And this is the wonderful thing about my service experience, is that the, on these deployments, I mean, not only did I learn a lot in the military about what I often refer to as civilian appreciation, the fact that, uh, you know, in living in 
uh, a military type environment, um, you have no privacy. You know, you appreciate things like restroom facilities, the privacy of that. Like in boot camp, the way ours was designed at the time, everything was open. So when you had the need to go like often early in the morning to utilize the bathroom, whatever it may be, everything was open. So as you're standing there trying to do your duty in nature, there's like 30 guys standing there saying, come on. Hurry up, I gotta go. <laughs> you're referring to some of the pictures that you had. You'll, we'll be able to see those. Yes, and then, and then, um, and so what it taught me more than anything else was just the civilian appreciation. The fact that it's late at night, you'd like a snack. Yes, some facilities would have vending machines that you would go to, but to go somewhere and pre prepare yourself some wholesome food or some fruit or something, you didn't have that resource. The galley, as we knew it, was closed. So again, it just makes you appreciate the simple, humble things that you take for granted when you live in a large yeah. barracks environment. And uh, one of so the like things- did you have any snacks like in your locker? I know we would, water. after a while. Yeah. Uh, I was always kind of pretty good about eating, so when I was out and about with friends, I would procure like apples or something, or some raisins <laughs> or something like that later. to be healthy, to say. Yeah. And uh, one, of the, one of the pictures that, uh, that I brought today was uh, typical, this happens to be one of when I was in Rota, Spain, and this was the environment in which all your worldly possessions were in this locker. Civilian clothes, military clothes, you know, entertainment things like radios and everything had to be stored in there. So, you know, it was rather limited in what you could do. Again, here's another picture of um, when we're in Rota, Spain. It's typical of the normal barracks. The fact that this particular barracks here is a cubicle. It's a huge, great big room. Now, granted, they have partitions, but these partitions do not run from floor to ceiling. So sounds no, and odors and yeah. all the stuff that go on. You can hear someone playing music that you didn't care for down at one end. There's country and western there. There's rock and roll at the other. All this stuff would carry around. You so need to put on your beat headphones. There you go. Well, if you had them back then. <laughs> But there again, within a cubicle was usually four guys, again, a very limited amount of privacy that you would have, but this was just the typical environment that you would, you would have in a barrack surrounding. So that, in and of itself, the Navy just really made you appreciate just all the amenities you have in civilian life that you just take for granted. And now talk about going out and seeing some things, like you said. You yes, like what, I, what, I often, what I often did is the fact that there were, with my limited resources that I had, because I was saving for the future in that, not to speak ill of a lot of my, uh, my fellow service guys, but a lot of guys, their, their thing was to go to the nearby town and yeah. take advantage of all of the drinking, drinking and carrying on that went there. But again, being a devoted guy to my girlfriend, I soon realized that the best thing to do was to connect with, with uh, fellow service guys that were married guys. You know, we kind of all had this camaraderie of you know being faithful to someone that we love back home and all that kind of stuff so and that was another thing that although I thought I was kind of a worldly guy as a young man that was really a wake-up call like our first deployment uh, going to Sangley Point I'm there on the barracks observing these gentlemen crying and holding their families and hugging them and realizing oh what a hardship I'm so glad I'm not married they're looking at six months separation from their family and that must be horrible all of a sudden we get into Sangley Point and there I am out in town and two nights later and there's this guy, he's got three bar girls around him and he's drunk and just having a good old time and I'm thinking, what a rascal, what a louse. <laughs> so a lot of these guys I kind of lost a lot of respect for, the fact that stateside they were one character and overseas they were just someone altogether different. But I, on the other hand, always took advantage of when I was in country to uh, take advantage of going out and re meeting the real people, not the people in the bars and all that. That, that wasn't typical of the country. That, that wasn't a good judgment of, you know, the people that you meet or anything like that. And this just happens to be one of the excursions that a good friend of mine, a gentleman by the name of Dan Seacrest and I, went on one of these canoe trips back in to kind of just deal with some of the native people. And one of the things I took to doing over in the Philippines was I got involved with a volunteer group that, yeah, I'm sure some of the Philippine people thought highly ill of us, by some of the behavior done by some of the guys, but there'd be a group of us that would go out and volunteer to uh, help with building schools and things like that, and I just really enjoyed having the opportunity to meet the native people and, and show them that we're not all ugly Americans. That we kind got of about thing. 20 minutes left. We're okay. fine, right? Okay. What about the language? How did you get the language in Spain? Most, mo most of the people were pretty good as far as, um, you know, as far as Philippines and that, 
that was never language was never really an issue very much they over there. Some, they had some English then. Oh yes, yes. Okay. We we had been in the Philippine Islands for a number of years, so English was pretty fluent over there among so them. So who was the friend with you? How did you guys know each other? Well, he was just a member in the squadron, okay. one of the guys I knew in the squadron. But to uh, kind of address another issue as far as not only did the Navy teach me a lot about um, uh, civilian appreciation, but I had the luxury of going to a variety of different countries. The Philippines, Spain, and Keflavik, Iceland was our final deployment which we went through from October of 69 to March of 1970. And it was so diverse. When I was in the Philippines at that time in the mid to late 60s, there was no middle class. Within the Philippine culture at that time, you were extremely wealthy, which was very few people, or you were extremely poor, you know. And so that was just the diversity within that culture. Now when I went the road to Spain, I went there at the time that uh, under the leadership of Francisco Franco. He was basically the dictator of Spain at that time. And you really had to be careful, even as a, a foreign person, about your behavior because there were like the local police and then there were like the Guardia Civil. And not to make the comparison of like, you know, the German army and the Gestapo, but that's basically what the Guardia Civil was like. They were his private police. They carried automatic weapons, they had very distinctive uniform, and any time they showed up in the presence of people, people were scared. Uh, we would utilize the trains a lot to travel around Spain. When, whenever these guys came on the car, people might be joking, laughing, carrying on, and all of a sudden everyone just stopped, <laughs> stared down at the floor, and just hoped that they didn't have to make eye contact with one of these guys. Because the experience was if one of these guys tapped you on the shoulder and you followed him, that might be the last anyone ever sees of you. So that was, you know, another environment in which people had to live under that I got to see. In fact, one of my experiences, and I'm very thankful, was again mentioning I got to know one of the gentlemen in, uh, in Spain at the facility I worked that allowed us to come down to his Mediterranean home. Mm -hmm. So without knowing any better, there were two of us, a friend and I one night, we uh, go to a nearby pub uh, partake of some of the wine and think, man, what a beautiful night. So we walk down to the beach and to much to our amazement, we're looking around the beach and thinking, this is such a beautiful amenity. I mean, there's no one here. Why doesn't people take advantage of this setting? Meanwhile, we're looking out and we're seeing these boats with lights shine up the shoreline and that and thinking, you know, I just can't believe people don't take advantage of such a wonderful thing. Well, we go back to the villa and telling the guy next day about our experience, and he's shaking his head. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. He said, don't ever do that again. I said, why? He said, those boats that you saw were the Guardia patrol boats basically looking for smugglers. Had they lit you up on the shore, they had have shot you and asked questions later, figuring that you're just a smuggler bringing items from North Africa into Spain. He said, you don't realize how you were lucky. And we were down there for a couple hours, and, and the lights are all around us flashing. And so, again, you. you know, just didn't see us. So I think we ought to get into your relationship with your wife. We're getting toward the end of the interview. Well, we'll, <laughs> well that's your call, though. That's well, we'll address that. We'll address that. Well, like I said, I had a wonderful time in, in Rota, Spain during that time. Our final deployment uh, was uh, Keflavik, Iceland which again was a very diverse culture from the standpoint that uh, where under Spain it was kind of like seeing how tyrantry people lived. Keflavik, Iceland, the culture there was how you got a semblance of how it felt to be treated like a second class citizen. In the late 60s, by us being allowed to be on uh, Iceland, they dictated everything to the U.S. government. It had only been a few years before that they say, in any personnel that you bring to Iceland, you're not to bring African Americans. You're not to bring people of color from the Philippines, only Caucasian people. We do not want our, uh, our society compromised. Mm -hmm. So finally, when we went there in 69, we did bring Filipino and African American people. But there was the understanding that in Iceland that they dictated with on our base, only at a given time could so many Americans be allowed off the base because they did not want their culture compromised by Americans being out there in large numbers. So if you wanted to go off the base, you would have to submit the paperwork, and maybe within four weeks you could go out for a day to spend time in the base. 
Okay. So what um, I experienced this on one occasion where finally got approval to go out and deal in the culture. Went into a fine restaurant one day and had the wait staff basically come up and say, we do not serve Americans. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, you'll have to leave. <laughs> and their hard feelings largely came about because of the way that when we were there during World War II, uh, again, we were not very good citizens to that. <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, their, uh, uh, their, their culture was uh, different. Uh, very socialized culture. You wanted nothing from cradle to grave. The fact that they taxed the heck out of you, but they provided all your education, uh, health care, everything that you could want. But, the, uh, but they were dealing with a lot of issues there from the standpoint that uh, alcoholism was really bad. Because to me, when Iceland is like being on the moon, you know, I mean, <laughs> there wasn't any vegetation to speak of, anything like that. Uh, they had a real issue that when people went to more formal training, such as medical training, things like that, United States and Europe, they never came back. You know, the fact that, wow, this is how the rest of the world lives. And also, they, they dictated, too, that one of the ways that we were able to keep touch with uh, home was uh, radio, Armed Forces Radio. Well, they dictated that they didn't want Armed Forces Radio broadcasted to the extent that it would go out into the public and, again, influence the p people by anything other than what they wanted them to know. So, again, it just gave me an insight into how other cultures live between the Philippines and Rhode Spain and Keflavik. Again, just gave me a real appreciation of this country, you know, how fortunate we are to have all the things we have. Uh, I'll address a personal issue now from the standpoint that um, after uh, Spain, I came home. Uh, my wife said, Where I don't want to. were you discharged? Well, I was discharged on April the 1st, 1970. But uh, after, after Road to Spain, I came home that summer oh, okay. uh, so in 69. Before, before you were yes, yes. Came home 69 and told my wife, or I should say my girlfriend, only one more year. And she said, I'm tired of waiting. <laughs> no one I am tired of waiting. She said, I want to get married. So I want to get married what, now. 20, I'm 21 and she's 20. And I said, wow, I, I don't know, Pam. She said, I want to get married. I'm tired of waiting. I waited three years. I want to get married. And I thought, okay. How long were I you going to be home? That was just it. I said, Pam, I'm not going to be home for very long. i got to ship out to, to Iceland. She said, I don't care. And I thought, okay, this would be good. This would be good from the standpoint that get her away from home, show her a little independence. You know, there was a real good wives network in place of, after all, I'd been hanging around with all these married guys got to know their wives, got to know their families. I said, there's a good good place. To, if I was to bring her back to, yeah. to Brunswick, I go overseas, I know there's people there to keep an eye out for. So we run off. In July of 1969, <laughs> we ran off to the Justice of Peace and got married. And an interesting story is her father has always been a very stoic guy. And my wife was the, the last of uh, seven girls. <laughs> He's looking at retirement. And I'm thinking, man, you know, run off with his daughter and got married, and all of his other girls had these big formal weddings. I think, man, I'm probably going to catch heck from this guy. So we get married, I'm really getting nervous. It's a Friday night. I'm going to announce to him that I married his daughter. Where is this guy? I hardly ever got a smile out of him. I said, well, Mr. Hutchinson, I just want to let you know that your daughter Pam and I got married today. He got this great big smile on his face like, oh. <laughs> Not another formal wedding, you know. <laughs> so he was tickled to death. So as it turned out, I ran back up to Maine, found us a place to live, came back and got Pam, brought her up there, and we spent the remainder of that summer together. Uh, like I said, got married in July of 69, brought her up there probably late July, August, <clears throat> and in October of 69, I shipped out to Iceland. And unfortunately, in my absence, her father suddenly passed away from a heart attack. And so uh, she had to go back home. She, as planned, the girls took care of her. All the other wives said, don't worry about it. We'll make sure you get to the airport. When you're ready to get back, just call us. We'll come and pick you up. In the meanwhile, my wife had found a job there on base working at the service exchange or basically the, the uh, place where all the goods are bought so, or sold there at the club. So she had a good job there on the base. So she was that kind of stuff. So as it turned out, uh, Keflavik, that deployment only was about five months. So in March, of 1970, I deployed back to the United States, and in short order, they told me, hey, we're going to downsize. So whereas your uh, employment, your, your enlistment would be up in July, we're going to let you go three months early. So 
April the 1st, you're free. We're going to cut you, cut you go. So, uh, so Pam and I at that point, Pam and I were, uh, both of our families were into antiques and collectibles. So we went up there with basically the clothes on our back to set up a household. So we took advantage of the fact that in New England, we could run around and buy all these antiques that they didn't realize they had, and there we were buying all this stuff. <laughs> we had this little two-bedroom apartment, and we just had it loaded full of stuff. Was as petty officer second class at the time I was discharged, I was entitled to have all my household goods shipped back. And I'll never forget the day these movers showed up thinking, little two-bedroom place, and they walked in and their jaws dropped to the floor like, all oh, this is yours? I mean, it was stacked from floor to ceiling <laughs> with all this stuff to be moved. And to make matters worse, it was a lot of antique items that was in need of repair. And that's something that we did later. My wife was a very talented lady to refinish, reupholster furniture. So we just bought things that were in need of repair. And of course, on their shipping manifest, they had the document, broken spindle on chair, <laughs> missing thing on this. So the other night I look at this list and it's about 10 pages long. And you know, these guys had to document every little thing that was wrong with everything sure they that they weren't held liable for it. So yeah, so, oh, wow. so, we, uh, so we came back and uh, got set up again and uh, uh, initially we lived in the Oakley Hyde Park area and then purchased a home in uh, Norwood. Uh, an interesting story behind that home purchase was the fact that it was a great big old Victorian home on one of the stately avenues of Norwood Floral Avenue. And when I went to my parents to tell them about the fact that Pam and I had purchased a house today, they said, oh great, that's wonderful, home ownership is wonderful. Where did you find a place? I said, on Floral Avenue. <gasps> They turned to each other and kind of smiled and said, when we first got married, we lived in, got to think, 1937, a large rooming house on Floral Avenue. They took a room, they shared a bath, they shared a kitchen with all these other people in 37. They said, oh yeah, we first got married, we lived on Floral Avenue. They said, where at? And I said, 4215 Floral Avenue. Their jaws dropped to the floor. That was the house that we lived in. They were so excited to get there, the fact that as soon as we got occupancy, they went over, that's our room, that's our room where we rent. So they lived there for the better part of a year. So they were tickled to death over the fact that, you know, there was a history there with the very first house as a married couple they lived in was the very first house that we owned. So, so yeah. So, so did you have children? I have two boys. And the interesting thing about uh, uh, my two boys, and I, I find interesting now is that uh, it was a number of years after they got out of high school that one day they were both there and I said, hey guys, never really thought to ask you that within your circle of friends, high school guys, things like that, or girls, did anyone ever go into the service? And I said, not that I can think of, which is interesting about our times and, yeah. and which is like the young lady that solicited me for the interview to think that we are in some ways kind of becoming rare birds anymore, yeah. you know. I mean, I don't remember really being around it either when I was growing yeah. up. I had to be close to your son's age, I would guess. Yep, yep. Yeah, just a lot of the peers simply were not, were not pushed, interested. To to interested. College, yeah. And like I say, based, based on uh, probably the Vietnam, I would have never gravitated to the service. Mm -hmm. You know, the yeah. fact that uh, I would have probably at some point pursued some additional education or training in something, married my high school sweetheart and moved on. But knowing that the prospect of possibly getting drafted was there, but I owe the service so much. Yeah, I was going to say, what did the <clears throat> skills, how did they translate? Well, oh, when, I, when I got out of the service, my dad uh, was uh, involved in several different and We've got about venues. seven minutes. So. Okay, he was, involved, <laughs> he was involved in the politics of the city of Norwood, so my dad said, listen, you're going to need a job. Uh, I'm involved in the Democratic Party in Norwood. I could speak in your behalf, get you a job with the city of Norwood. I said, no, Dad, the city of Norwood has a residency requirement. He said, how about the Alice Chalmers Corporation? where I'm work. I said, that's a better fit. So he uh, gets me an application, I fill it out. So I meet with the guy who's the head of human resources. And the gentleman happened to be Jim Weiler, the Jeff Weiler, the car magnet's dad. Wonderful guy, Jim's a wonderful guy. Well, I interview with Jim. He said, I got someone else I want you to talk to. Okay, another gentleman comes down, interviews me at length, and then Jim comes back and said, I've got a job for you. <clears throat> Perhaps it's not what you had in mind. I was thinking I would just simply get a factory job along with my dad. No, they offered me a job in the office. Wow, me a job in the office? Apparently, once again, I must have talked my way into it or I took a simple test that I did well on. <clears throat> so I went to work in the office environment and over the years did a variety of different things. I worked in purchasing, I worked in material control, wide variety of different white collar jobs. 
in my final, <clears throat> final job with them was an expediter based on my experience of knowing how the plant worked in all the different ways. Whenever they'd have trouble with an order, I was the troubleshooter to make sure the problem got resolved. Well, as often happens in corporate America, after 12 years, thinking that I've got a career at this place, I get called into the office one Friday afternoon and said, we don't have need for your services anymore. Out you go. I mean, it was one of the most traumatic things that ever happened to me because I was blindsided. It occurred in the early 80s when the recessionary period was bad, no jobs to be found. <clears throat> and it was at that point that I decided, you know, I'm, I'm going to change my life. And I'd love, I want to tell this story for you. My father uh, <clears throat> died of cancer as a young guy in his early 50s. Uh, he was uh, basically a, uh, he had his comfort zone in the tri-state area. He was afraid to travel, do anything like that. So my dad, upon his cancer, uh, I'm with him when he, when he dies. And the final words that my dad ever spoke under this coma of narcotic drugs, he turns to me, and he's wide-eyed, and he says, I never saw the ocean. I never saw the ocean. And I'm thinking to myself, and I'm reflecting, what he was reflecting on, the fact that my mom, on the other hand, at this point, I had siblings that had lived in Florida, California, and Hawaii. Now my mom traveled. She saw all these things. Now my dad in his comfort zone, airplane, tri-state area, I can't do that. But she would come back and share these wonderful things with him. But he never traveled. And when I thought about that, he was reflecting on his life of missed opportunities. And so those words that my dad spoke about, never saw the ocean, I have used to be the inspiration throughout my life. At this point that I lost my job, I said, listen, I'm going to change everything. Forget that white collar environment. It just doesn't suit me. I'm going to go back to school. With the training I got in the Navy, my electronics, I went back to school. I uh, became a machinist. Between the two skill sets of being a machinist, and the electronic background, a good fit for me was maintenance, the fact that it required both skill sets. I initially got a little job at a food packaging place, and after that I got a job that I retired from 30 years from the U.S. Postal Service, working on all the processing and sorting equipment, a job that I absolutely loved doing. But every time that I faced uh, an issue in my life, like selling this big Victorian home that I had in Norwood to relocate to the country, I thought to myself, never saw the ocean. I would always be my inspiration about not wanting to have a regret like my dad did. So throughout my adult life, any time I faced the real issue of following my heart or following my head, I say, like with the B Club, I do public presentations for the B Club. Public speaking, gosh, to have asked me a number of years ago that I would go out and do public speaking, something that was near and dear to my heart, and I would say, never saw the ocean. Don't have any regret about not doing something that you would really like to do. And like I said, my dad's final words have served to be the inspiration on a lot of things that I've done do in my life. Do you have any grandkids yet from the two boys? I do not. I have one son that's kind of a confirmed bachelor, and the other son, apparently he and his wife have chosen not to, to have a family. So I'm understandable of that. So um, I, the, the, I'm very fortunate that I enjoy good health. What is sad is that my wife, uh, who I lost uh, five and a half years ago, is not here to enjoy it with me. That's the sad part. I have a couple of questions. Sure, Roy. Uh, at the time that you were being discharged from the Vietnam era, I know you told me you didn't have any honest answers, but would you put on tape the fact of what you heard because the liberal college professors that write the history book will not put in what happened to the veterans that come back? Well, Roy, Vietnam. you may, you may be referring to the stories that uh, guys in uniform, like at airports or things like that, were treated with disrespect. Were spit on. Well, I, I have to say in all honesty, as part of when I traveled uh, commercially and things like that, in order to get the military type thing, yes, you would have to travel in, in uniform. And to be quite honest, Roy, I never encouraged any, any behavior well, like I, that. I know you told me that, mm -hmm. but I, mm -hmm. I surely you heard it. I heard stories. Did I ever witness anything like okay. that? Did I ever hear well, from a okay. fellow of that? I can't say that I have. Okay, well, the next question so, is... Oh, well, we're out of time. So thank you very much for your time okay. today, Gary. Thank well, you. you're thank welcome. You. <clears throat> Luckily, in this part of the country, we've got some wonderful resources.
Oh, yeah. You've got to talk 70 minutes, Gary. <clears throat> Probably.